average, the county as a whole has saved 22.66% um, compared to calendar year 2013. Um, what does that mean in actual quantity of water? Um, this graph is just showing the beginning of the regs starting in June and going to March. And basically, um, as a county, we saved, compared to 2013, we saved 103,000 acre feet of water. That's in a 10 month period. So just kind of put it into perspective, that's equal to four Irvine lakes. Um, <coughs> Irvine Lake is very dry right now, so if we had four of them right now, that would be great. Um, in terms of, and, and I know this isn't the, the, the most perfect way to, uh, to put a cost to it, but if you were to buy that water from MET and treat that water, that water would cost essentially $96 million, which is roughly the GDP of the Marshall Islands. And I, I, I did this at, a, <laughs> at, our, at our joint uh, planning meeting on Wednesday, but I wanted to also, you know, add something new because some people are seeing the same thing over and over. That's a equivalent to buying 1,280 Tesla model assets. So, <laughs> <laughs> luxury cars. So, so we're talking a lot of water, a lot of money. Um, in terms of where we're looking at. Um, where I'm projecting where we're going to finish our usage for the rest of this fiscal year. Uh, right now, it's going to be around 475,000 acre feet. Um, if you notice, that's the, the, the dash um, bar on the far right. Um, something interesting to note is that we haven't used this, um, we've only used this least amount of water since the 1982-83 fiscal year. So. Um, and an interesting point was in 1983, our water demands were kind of fueled by record. We actually, that year was an El Nino year. It was one of the strongest El Nino years. We had just torrential rain. It rained almost 27 inches that year. Um, I wasn't around, but you know, growing up in San Clemente, you always hear that was March 1st, 1983. That's when the pier broke. So um, everyone knows that um, from my area. So, so that was just, one of the uh, wettest winters we've had down here. In terms of how we're conserving this year, well, it's definitely not from the rain. Um, it, this is fueled mo mostly by the state uh, regulations. So just something interesting to point out that um, I was born in 1982, so I was born in that fiscal year. So in my lifetime, I have not seen water usage this low in the county. So just in, to kind of think about how long ago 1983 was, Here's a picture of South Coast Plaza in the early 80s. So a lot has changed. It's, the county is much different now than it was back then. Um, so just kind of put put that perspective that, you know, I know last April, no one thought, you know, we could save this much water. Everyone thought the sky was falling. And not only we saved, that we've, we've basically gone back in time and are using the same amount of water we did in the early 80s. So just. Something interesting to know. Um, local weather conditions. Um, I was up at Irvine Lake uh, early, late, late April, and I took a couple of these pictures. As you can see, the reservoir is really, really low right now. Um, actually, the two agencies, Serrano and Irvine, are putting water into the reservoir. But the lake, as you can see, did not get a lot of natural runoff this winter. Um, if you look at where we're at um, in terms of rainfall for Southern California, we, we measured the rainfall uh, at Santa Ana at the Crime Lab. There's a uh, rain gauge up there. And so basically, as of today, um, we've received 8.14 inches of rain for this fiscal year. So our average is 12, almost 13 inches. So if you notice the last five years, all below average, very, very dry. Um, and if you were to, if you were to look at the last five years, what our deficit is compared to normal rainfall, it's 28 and a half inches. So essentially, to get back up to normal conditions, you would almost need a normal year and then 28 inches on top of that. So it's very, very dry down here. So, and one thing I looked at was the deficit that we have is actually the worst deficit since they've been recording um, rainfall uh, in Santa Ana. So this next graph, it, it's a little confusing, but basically this is the entire rainfall amounts compared to the average going back to 1908. So 
Anything in blue means the rainfall was above average. Anything in red means the rainfall was below average. What you need, one thing to look at is the consecutive red years. So the, those are periods of drought. If you notice uh, in the late 40s, we had six consecutive years of um, below average rainfall, which we're at five this year. So, you know, we've seen in the past, we've gone through six dry years. So I'm not saying it's gonna be dry next year, but I'm saying it has happened before. But in, in that period, the deficit was 24 and a half inches. Um, the late 80s, we, I'm sure a lot of you guys remember, um, we had a big drought and we had five years uh, below average rainfall down here. That deficit was 20 inches. And then you see where we're at today, our five years of below average precipitation is at 28 and a half inches. So like I said, it, this is the worst deficit locally we've seen since we've been recording rainfall um, going back to 1908. Um, let's move it to uh, regional water supply and weather conditions. Um, the eight station index, basically this is uh, eight, um, eight gauges up in Northern California that essentially um, measure the health of the state water project um, watershed. Um, as of a couple weeks ago, the, uh, the amount was at 57.7 inches. This is good, this is 119% normal of where we're at normally this year. And if you look at the monthly charts, you can kind of see, basically we started off not good this fall. December and January were great. February was just not good at all. And then we have March. March is kind of the month, and I'm sure you guys have all heard it, the month that basically saved, saved Northern California this year. So we had a great month of March. Um, so that's the situation with the uh, precipitation up north. In terms of snowpack, um, on the left is the Northern Sierra snowpack water equivalent. And we peaked this year. April 1st is kind of, it's the end of the winter season, so the snow the snowpack kind of peaks at that point and then it melts as it goes in the summer. We peaked this year, April 1st, at 97% of average. So basically, it was a normal year um, on, for snowpack in the Northern Sierras. Um, one thing to note, though, interesting is that if you see that blue line, it just drops, and meaning that it's been warm up there, the snow's melting a lot quicker than it normally does in the past. Uh, moving to the Colorado River Basin, um, they finished their peak April uh, at 90% of average, and the snow's kind of melting um, basically to average. So that's kind of the snowfall situation on Northern California and in the Colorado River Basin. Um, now looking at storage on the Colorado River, um, the, top, uh, the top graph shows lake mean storage levels going back to January 2002. And as you can see, the green line represents the surplus trigger and the red line represents the shortage trigger. Now these triggers only go into effect if the levels of the, of the reservoir are at those levels at the end of the calendar year. So essentially, if we were below that 1075 right now, it wouldn't mean anything. It's just how we finish. Um, at the end of December. So right now, that reservoir is very, very, very low. It's at um, 180 feet above sea level, so we're, we're basically five feet um, over that shortage trigger. It looks like the Bureau is projecting we're gonna dip a little bit this summer, but then they're gonna fill, fill up a little bit, drain some water out of Powell. So we'll be over that hump this at the end of this calendar year and now and they're showing that we're going to drop again next year and then January 2018 it's kind of questionable where we're going to finish over there and just to kind of give you to, to zoom out a little bit and to show you Lake Mead historically going back since it was filled in the 30s this is kind of the the reservoir as it's gone by the years and you notice basically since 2000 we've seen this drop and basically the last 14 out of 17 years, we've seen decline in that reservoir. So the, the health of Lake Mead is not great right now. Um, and a lot of people, you know, the, some people say that that whole system is over allocated. There's every year more water's going out than coming in. Um, I think the main take from this is that it's gonna take a while <laughs> weather-wise to get back up to healthy levels in that reservoir. So, and keep in mind, Lake Mead is the largest reservoir in the United States. So it's, 
it's a very important reservoir. Um, so that is the situation on the Colorado River. Um, let's look at drought conditions. I know it, it's probably confusing for the public because you know they see rain, they hear about all the good news up in Northern California. You know they don't know if, the, if we're still in drought, if we're out of drought, and then people kind of just make up their own opinions that oh they're not in a drought. And basically, um, the National Weather Service is what determines a drought. It's it's not the media. It's basically they come up with these these drought intensities monitoring and basically in October of going into the wet season October 6 2015 this is on the left side this is what the drought monitor was showing for the western United States now if you look at to where we were two weeks ago May 2017 you see a lot of improvement but unfortunately a lot of that improvement is in the Pacific Northwest or it doesn't really affect um, California's water supply. So you, you, you see improvement, but if you notice, much of California, I, I believe it's something around 90% of California is still in drought. Um, not as severe as we were back in October, but also keep in mind that it's May. It's not going to rain in June. It's not going to rain in July. It's not going to rain in August. It's not going to rain in September. It probably won't rain in October. So we're basically going to ride the next five months, it's going to be dry. So I anticipate that chart will get redder as the season progresses. And then just to kind of um, conclude um, on this, uh, water supply conditions are normal to slightly normal for Northern California. Um, Southern California is in its fifth straight year of below average precipitation. Um, table A, uh, I didn't talk about it, but Metropolitan's Table A, uh, or the Table A allocation for the state contractors is at 60%. Basically means about 100 or 1.2 million acre feet of net water um, coming down here. Uh, there's a good chance we'll have a favorable allocation going into next year in 2017. Uh, MWD is projecting a supply of 2.2 million acre feet, and they project they can put about 0.5 million acre feet into storage this year. And then the Colorado system continues to decline, and there is a possible shortage at Lake Mead in calendar year 2018. And majority of California is still in the drought, and we can hope maybe we'll get some rain next year. And with that, I'll we'll take any questions. Is that, is that how old is this stuff related to Lake Mead? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so think of. And, and, and I'm oversimplifying it. So, so basically, Lake Powell's upstream of Lake Mead. And so if you have a good water year, Lake Powell fills up. And then Lake Mead doesn't really get affected by that. But then you'll want to put water into Lake Mead. So you'll drain Powell. You will fill up another good winter. So that's kind of how they work. I, I'm, I'm being really yeah, yeah, yeah. simple. I was just trying to figure out whether Lake Powell was providing anything of this or not. It essentially, so so I showed there was about it was about ninety percent of normal on that river basin. So so basically that's ninety percent normal um, flows going into Lake Powell. So basically that's below average, and so that means below average going to meet, and that's that's kind of why that reservoir keeps on going down. So they kind of if Powell goes up the next year, meat will go up and Powell will kind of drain. But if you keep on if that reservoir keeps on filling up every year, meat will fill up. But as you see, it's they're just they're just not getting inflows in, into power for the last 15 years. So. <clears throat> yeah, much more important than the, the data that you've given us. How are the Delta smelt doing? Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, um, the next presenter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were doing no good. Association. Uh, I want to uh, talk about two initiatives that CSDA is currently engaged in. First one is public outreach. Now, public outreach is vital for all of your districts out there because if you're not telling your story, 
via your website, the local media, social media, someone else is gonna tell your story. And you don't want a legislator or a local reporter or HBO's John Oliver talking about special districts. We need your stories out there. So CSDA realized this. We did a poll last year, a statewide poll, basically asking uh, uh, Californians, you know, give us an example of a special district or a water district. And uh, not surprisingly, very low. But when we talked about the services you provide, it went through the roof, unbelievable numbers. And I'll give you a real life example of this. Uh, last month I spoke to two college uh, political science classes. I spoke at Cal State Fullerton and UC Irvine. And a total of 180 students. And I asked them first thing, okay, how many of you can give me an example of a special district? Three out of 180. <coughs> but when I asked them, hey, how many of you guys were really stoked you had a hot shower this morning, your toilet flushed, your garbage was taken out, your softball game was scheduled, uh, you weren't bitten by mosquitoes, everyone's hand rose, right? <laughs> so there's a disconnect between the special districts and the services you provide, and we're trying to close that gap and try to educate everyone. So we initiated uh, districts make the difference public outreach campaign. I put some uh, brochures out on, your, on the tables here. I have extras here if you didn't get one. Um, it is a website with a full toolkit of things for you guys to share with your customers and with your constituents. Uh, we have fact sheets on every type of special district that there uh, that exists. Uh, we have all types of Facebook and Twitter and all kinds of social media options. I want to hear from you. If you guys are doing some cool event and you have a kids art contest for posters or you have a video contest or any grand opening, any of those things, please let me know. I've got plenty of business cards. I want to take that and get that out there to the general public to show what you guys are doing out there because generally it gets lost in the shuffle and people just, you know, unless there's a problem, you don't hear from them. And uh, we need the education. I, I, I used to work for Congressman John Campbell for 13 years. I hardly knew about special districts and I worked in government. And I find a lot of my colleagues in the same arena do not know either. And I've been meeting with local legislators and their district staffs. And you'd be surprised how many of this, these district staffers have no clue how many special districts are here in Orange County, for instance, uh, versus other counties and, and the whole state. So I encourage all of you, visit the website, like us on Facebook, uh, share your stories with me so I can get that information out. I'd be happy to help. Uh, second would be legislative advocacy. Uh, I'd give you a legislative update today, but you know, I'd tell you about Bill now, three hours and maybe gutted an amendment. So I, I don't want to give any false information considering what's going on in Sacramento right now. Um, but we are uh, fully engaged with uh, the state legislature. We have an outstanding lobbying team. If any of you have questions about legislation that affects your district, please let me know. I want to connect you with one of our lobbyists. Uh, I have another brochure, Take Action. Um, the month of May or uh, when bills are introduced, those aren't the only times to get engaged. You guys got to stay engaged all year long. And that means another thing, connecting with your local <coughs> legislators. Uh, and that's another thing I'm help helping facilitate is I'm uh, taking the special districts, taking district staff, putting them together, and educating them on what they do. And you'd be surprised how many of these district staffers are just you know, overwhelmed and wow, you know, this is great what you guys do. They just don't know. Uh, so I have like a four seasons of advocacy. So you can follow all this. Uh, it's just a matter of being engaged. So um, uh, I know I'm probably getting the hook here pretty quick. So uh, I, I feel something over there. But uh, I appreciate your kind attention and uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. series of great reports. We know what our water supply picture looks like. We also know what we as special districts need to do to uh, address the uh, raised by Chris. And so now we're at the uh, our, our main uh, program for today. And certainly our program is on the Delta, but I can guarantee you it's going to be a different type of program compared to the many that we've had in the past. And I'd like to introduce our uh, speaker. Fortunately, we had some time to talk to him last night. And uh, just by way of background, uh, uh, he is a, a registered civil engineer, went to UC Davis. After he uh, uh, graduated, he went to work uh, with his main uh, 
position was with the uh, state of California with the local regional water quality control board for a couple years. And then he went to uh, the Department of Water Resources, which we know oversees the state water uh, project and, and uh, also all the issues in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. And during his tenure at DWR, he was managing uh, many of the uh, Department of Water Resources uh, planning efforts in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. And one thing in looking at uh, the roles that he has had in the Delta, we have heard about the many issues in the Delta. The primary focus that we've been concerned about are the fishery impacts and also Delta outflow. And so, but I just, just like to re, uh, refresh, and we're going to hear more about it. Is what are some of the, uh, what, what, what's the totality of the issues in the Delta? And certainly we're aware, uh, and, and our speaker has been deeply involved in that with his 21 years with DWR, is the uh, a, a levy improvement program, land subsidence, economic risk analysis, dredge material planning, water quality studies, and uh, environmental restoration. And so when he left DWR around uh, 2006, he went to work for the Metropolitan Water District as a consultant to continue uh, his involvement in the Delta activities. And, uh, and also with Metropolitan, he's been working greatly on the water conveyance systems that have been under consideration and, and we're starting to you know, finalize that. So. With all this uh, information, our speaker is well qualified to uh, further discuss these detailed issues in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ertz Woody to talk to us about the Delta. Thanks again, Justin. Appreciate it. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, how, how long do I have? Nice Tuesday. Probably about a quarter to. Uh, in March, that's 110,000 acres, about 52,000 acres of managed seasonal wetlands, and about 30,000 acres of basin slate. So, just a quick fly in to the delta, and a little bit about the geology. Our delta, fairly new. Um, our delta has only been around for the last seven to 10,000 years. Um, prior to that time, if you, so the delta is here, uh, say 10,000 years ago, San Francisco Bay was not a bay but a valley. If you wanted to go out to the ocean, you had to go out well past San Francisco to the Fairlong Islands to get to the beach. What happened over the last 7,000 years is as sea level has risen some 300 feet, it's filled in the bay and back tidewaters up into the delta and in the process created this delta that used to exist 150 years ago and accumulating large amounts of highly organic peat soil in the process of raising 300 feet. And that's significant. So the delta historically looked like that. And then we've got an animation we created that shows you what we believe the delta used to look like 200 years ago. We're starting out in the western part. We're going east. That's the Sassoon Marsh and the Sacramento River, or San Joaquin River, and the Sacramento River over there, Sherman Island. This was a very wild place. Elk, grizzly bear, um, lots and lots of salmon. Uh, no? So this, this was the delta as it existed 150 years ago. Hardly recognizable today in terms of uh, when you go out, many of you have been out in the Delta to see what it looks like. But this, this is the Delta that used to be, and then starting in the 1860s, uh, by decade through the 1930s, this very wild place was levied off and drained for farming. And as a result, has created the Delta we know today, which is a drastically different place. 98% of the wetlands that used to exist have been destroyed, and we end up with the Delta today. We're gonna to hop on a little helicopter, fly out over Staten Island cornfield, pop up over a, a levee, and show you what the Delta looks like today. So I 
created a graphic here to show you a comparison. This happens to be Sherman Island, looking west, um, Bradford in the foreground, and by way of looking at those red stars and the yellow crosses, you can see the same location on these two different maps and see the change that has occurred. For instance, if you look at the Sacramento River today, it's this very wide, straight channel. Historically, it was a very narrow, meandering channel. These changes have had significant impacts on the, the aquatic ecosystem in the Gulf. There's been a 73-fold reversal in the, the ratio of marsh to open water as a result of that levying, draining, and channelization of the Gulf. And just as close a spot of some of the, what the terrain looked like in the delta. And if you're a fish, you a native fish, if you're a delta smelt, a, a longfin smelt, a salmon, you evolved in a system that looked like that panel on the left, in which all of that purple area was your home. And what we have today is a small fraction of what these fish evolved in. We've, we've transformed the delta into something completely different that really favors these non-native species like striped bass and the largemouth bass. So the delta used to look like this. All of that um, turquoise area was all tidal marsh. And there were these broad gradients, and this was all tidal marsh, and now it's all gone. So what's a riparian forest look like? This is what used to border some of the major channel systems. Um, as an artist rendition of the North Delta, again, you would be hard pressed to find anything that looks like that um, other than a few spots in the Yellow Bypass. Uh, this is void in many and most of the North Delta. In the Western Delta and parts of the Central Delta, um, used to look like this. There were large stands of Thule Marsh to get rid of the cooling towers and the stacks in the background. Thule's about eight feet tall, used to be a predominant species throughout the delta system. Uh, artist, or a photograph from 100 years ago showing these very meandering channel systems, scrub shrub, remnant or the historical natural levee system that used to exist. Turns out these channel margin habitat areas are extremely important for our native salmon in particular, for a lot of other species, but salmon and their migration through the delta uh, really are dependent upon these types of habitat. Uh, riparian forest, Thule marsh, and, and a com comparison here of the channel system as it used to exist here in red with the channel system today, uh, we've had a tremendous reduction. Historically, over 5,000 miles of channels in the delta today, about 700 miles. And you get an idea of how these channels have been changed. Uh, you're a fish, you're in the potato slough, you want to go from A to B, relatively short distances compared to what you used to travel 100 years ago. Um, so what happened in the mid-late 1800s, Chinese laborers came in, started building levees, clamshell dredges like this one made building levees much easier, uh, and then we ended up with this. That's what the delta predominantly is today instead of that broad area of tooling marsh. Um, lots of corn crop <coughs> delta, and more grapes are coming in uh, now into the central delta as well. Uh, asparagus in the south delta. And this is a photo from National Geographic. This is Mildred Island in the foreground. And just some shots of the delta today. This is uh, Holland Tract, Old River, taking water down to the export facilities. So hopefully you can see the subsidence. Uh, Water surface elevation is higher than the land. And then a little bit about fish. So in the delta, we have some native fish species. I used to ask groups, you know, what, if anybody could tell me what that is. Sturgeon. And somebody said a girl, and I couldn't argue with them. <laughs> <laughs> Sturgeon are a native species. This happens to be a white sturgeon. Um, green sturgeon are listed under the Endangered Species Act. So like delta smelt, uh, winter wren salmon, uh, we go to great lengths to protect. And then of course we have salmon and uh, adult salmon. This happens to be a winter wren salmon as well as salmon fry. And it's the plight of these little guys, well both actually, that we are very concerned about in the Delta. We are losing a 
a tremendous number of Delta smelt in the Delta. Um, during the last three or four years, the counts, or the based on telemetry data, of juvenile salmon coming down the San, San Joaquin River has been almost zero, if not zero, survival through the Delta. And in the Sacramento River, the survival has not been much better, around 20 to 25 percent survival coming down through the Delta. Can you give us some idea of the rise in temperature in the last 10, 20 years? I don't have that off the tip of my tongue. Oh, so uh, fishers, uh, fish are sensitive to the temperatures, are they not? They are. They are. I don't have those numbers. Do the sturgeon eat the snow? Sturgeon are bottom feeders and mainly eating the clams and stuff on the bottom. And then you probably know what these are. Any guesses? This happens to be the most, I'd say this is the most powerful fish in the world able to turn off large pumps. Um, <laughs> that is a delta smelt and they're about four inches long. If I blindfolded you, brought you around, uh, you think, think I had a cucumber in my hand because they have very strong cucumbers there. Um, most, 95% will, will live one year, a few percent live two years. Um, and then that's an inland silver site on the top, introduced into the Clear Lake in the 50s to control gnats. It got out of the Clear Lake and into the Delta and is now a much more, much more prevalent fish uh, in the Delta. And then we have, probably not many of you know, we do have a delta smelt fish hatchery in the delta. Um, UC Davis, down by the Banks pumping plant, is raising about 200,000 delta smelt every year in the delta, or at the edge of the delta. They uh, go to great lengths. You can see these little orange tags on each one of the fish to genetically um, look at their, their DNA. As, so when they're breeding these fish, they're making sure that there is um, as little inbreeding as possible and they're maintaining the wild stock. They do bring in wild stock in addition. And so they are raising 200,000 fish every year. And at the end of the year, other than the fish that are used for experiments, all of those fish are destroyed and they start over again. None of these fish are being reintroduced back into the world. So this, these are the endangered fish species and the years they were listed, uh, we deal with in the Delta. And then we have these guys, largemouth bass and stripers. Uh, the largest stripers, about 74 pounds, good size uh, bass, maybe 15 pounds, 17 pounds. We have big bass tournaments in the Delta. Um, Largemouth bass or striped bass were introduced into the Delta by rail car in the 1870s. They brought in 470 striped bass into the Delta. By the turn of the century, they were harvesting over a million pounds of stripers out of the Delta. Voracious eaters. Matter of fact, if you cut open a baby striper, uh, you might find some salmon inside. Inflows in the Delta in terms of hydrology, 80% of the good quality water from the Sacramento River, um, about 15% saltier water coming in from the San Joaquin. The tides dominate uh, the Delta. So it's important to talk about salt, of course, when we talk about the Delta. And uh, we have a freshwater Delta. We maintain the Delta fresh because with reservoir release, we are constantly pushing the salt out. UC Davis did a quick calculation and looked at the average um, tonnage of salt that is exported out of the South <coughs> Delta. About 5,400 tons of salt are exported. By moving the intakes from down here up to the north part of the Delta, we estimate that that salt load would be, do, be reduced by over 60%, which is a big deal because when that water gets down here, it's important for that water to be as low salinity water as possible so that you can recycle it more often. Today, um, the, the X2 line, this is the measurement of salinity intrusion into the delta is at about 76 kilometers. And we typically tend to hold the X2. Here's the delta out here, the Sassoon Marsh. This is the region where we have to release water in order to maintain this salinity zone for environmental reasons. So X2 today is about right in here. 
And then we had a little scary situation a little over two years ago, middle of a drought, extremely dry January, and we had salinity intrusion well into the Delta. Uh, we were about ready to lose control of the Delta. Had salt continued to come in much further, we would have rounded the corner, got down into the South Delta, we would have had a hard time getting it out. So how does salt mix in the Delta? This is the primary, one of the main reasons salt mixes is what we call tidal trapping. Uh, color of the salt, this is Frank's trap. As water comes in, it mixes. What comes in doesn't go out. This is Old River, and that's water headed to you here in Orange County. Um, and that's how seawater, bromides, and salt mix into the Delta and get exported. So how does California get its water? That's the primary, currently, the primary mode of transfer from North Delta North to south across the delta, this is the preferred pathway to get water across. But then you have a lot of islands in between, uh, agricultural discharges, dissolved organic carbon, which is trihalomethane precursor. And now I'm gonna quickly go through what I call the triple S threat, why I can say that the delta, the paradigm we need to have is what the delta is going to look like, not what the delta looks like today. The delta is under some extreme forces, and I'm going to go through those. Sea level rise, subsidence, and seismic. So first, sea level rise. We've been told to plan for 55 inches of sea level rise by the end of the century, about two feet by 2050. Uh, what happens when sea level rises which may not be intuitive, as these channels into the delta get deeper, it allows the heavier salt water to encroach further up into the delta. Our hydraulic models indicate with three feet of sea level rise, you can expect about three miles of additional salinity intrusion into the delta. In order to counteract that, you're either gonna to have to release more water, a lot more water, to push that salt back out, or you have to move your intakes, or you take less water. The other thing that happens with sea level rise is its impact on the delta levee system. So DWR, some four or five years ago, did an estimate of the number of islands that would be underwater with four feet of sea level rise. And many of the delta islands would be inundated. Second S, subsidence, what is it? The delta was at sea level and rising and then levee building started, and it started this subsidence process. The land surface for the last 120 plus years has been going down, while the sea level has continued to rise. Consequently, the levees that were once two feet tall are now 20, 25, maybe 30 feet tall. So that's me, I'm waving my arms, I'm standing down at about 25 feet below sea level, and that channel over the left is at sea level. Uh, what causes subsidence? These, highly or these peat soils are about 80% organic matter, just like the pile of weeds that you would take out of your, your lawn and you pile them up, or you know, any green waste, you pile it up, you come back a week or two later and you notice your pile's gotten smaller. Here in the delta, these peat soils, highly organic, you expose them to oxygen and they start decomposing. That decomposition process is releasing large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and in the process, causing the land surface elevations to drop historically as much as six inches a year. Today, land surface elevations are dropping maybe an inch a year, going down. The delta uh, historically had accumulated about six billion cubic meters of peat soil as a result of this levee building process and subsidence oxidation. Uh, we've managed to destroy about 3 billion cubic meters of peat soil that nature took 7,000 years to create. We end up with a big hole in the ground. All of these areas in color are below sea level. Um, and as a result, one of the things that we're starting to see in greater and greater, and uh, we talked about this last night, is this idea of seepage onto the islands. So the islands historically were at sea level, during the last ice age, a very thick sand layer was laid down. And as the islands have subsided, this peat layer has gotten much thinner. 
and there's nothing now or very little to hold that hydrostatic pressure from coming up to the surface. And so what's happening is we're seeing this occurring where seepage from the side channel is coming in and boiling up onto the islands. You can build these levees higher and wider and it does nothing to stop this seepage problem. It's going to continue to occur. So all of these islands in green are subject to this artesian condition. Um, right now there's about 4,000 acres of farmland that's no longer farmable because of the higher seepage rates. Our modeling is indicating that by 2050, over 26,000 acres will no longer be farmable. And that just, the longer we continue the current path, the greater the, the loss of farmland due to the seepage problem, irrespective of how many billions of dollars you want to spend building levees. So that's an artesian well. And then from a flooding standpoint, the Public Policy Institute estimated 90% probability half the islands are going to fail in the next 50 years. Dreams had a 50% chance 20 islands would fail due to earthquake by 2030. That's the high risk zone. Uh, this happens to be some high water on Twitchell Island. Give you an idea of what it looks like when you have high tides, uh, higher runoff, and high winds in the Delta. Um, the Delta Levy Program, the program I used to manage, has spent about $750 million, um, and between $50 and $100 million in the maximum years that they've been spending on that improvement. Now that's all predominantly uh, taxpayer money through the form of bond, bonds that have been passed by the voters uh, funding these Delta levy programs. Uh, there is a small local cost share, but not very much. And now the third S, earthquake, seismic. These are the major fault systems that run through the Bay Area. We have a Midland fault that runs right underneath the Delta. Um, and there's a the seismologists say there's a good two-thirds chance of magnitude 6.5 or greater hitting by 2032. Every day that goes by, uh, the risk is increasing because the strain on the faults is increasing. Um, this is what I call my tombstone plot. Um, we have plotted all the earthquakes that have occurred. Um, you can see this is a logarithmic scale going way back in the 1800s. We had a lot of earthquakes in the 1800s, very few earthquakes. The past century, as a result, there's been a lot of strain building on these faults. That's why the seismologists say, you know, we're really due for some big earthquakes in the Bay Area. If this 1906 earthquake that hit San Francisco <coughs> were to happen today, the best estimates are from the DREAMS process, 22 islands would fail in the Delta today. So here's an animation showing you what the Delta will look like when we get that big earthquake hitting the Delta. Um, this happens to be an earthquake occurring on July 1st, 2002. Each one of these red dots is a levee that's being shaken and liquefied. So when you shake these levees that are fully saturated with water, uh, they can liquefy and slump. And when they slump, then you can get overtopping of the levees and water rushes in to fill that huge void that's been created by subsidence. We're trying to fill a void of over 2 million acre feet of water maybe, and there's not enough water in the Delta Channel, so the water's gotta come from the ocean. This is in the minutes after the earthquake. Uh, Web tracks, Bethel, Holland tracks, Aiken, you know, these islands are filling up with water very rapidly. And we have calculated on our computer models that the velocities in the channel is about 19 feet per second as water is racing back up into the delta. So now the ocean starts coming back in. You can follow the timeline. We're about 12 hours after the earthquake. This animation is going to speed up. And you can watch the delta quickly fill in a matter of a couple days uh, with ocean salts. And your drinking water supply, or a portion of it, is right here and now blocked off from fresh water as a result of this massive salinity intrusion into the Delta.
So what are we gonna do if that earthquake happens today or tomorrow? Our plan is to build an emergency pathway. First of all, a little bit about the economics based on the Dreams report. Um, if you combine the loss of that water supply and the probability of that earthquake and the, the magnitude of the levee failures, uh, you get something, you get a series of curves, but one point on the curve, something easy to remember, 30, 30, 30, a 30% 30 chance of a $30 billion loss by 2030. So what happens if the earthquake happens today? Our plan is to build what we call the emergency pathway, shore up the levees along the Middle River. We're in the process of doing that, stockpiling emergency supplies, closing off channels, and eventually creating that pathway from the freshwater down to the export facilities, maybe six months to complete that process. A little bit about fish. We have these restrictions, as you all well know, uh, from the Fish and Wildlife Service in Old and Middle River to reduce take on Delta smelt. And as a result of these take limitations, there have been some fairly significant, these are old numbers, but more recent years we've seen again a consistent um, large hit, uh, if you will, in the terms of water supply from the restrictions on Delta smell. There are other impacts on Delta smell in the fishery, of course, exotic species, toxics, and I believe the big one is the habitat loss when you take away 90%. Um, we have exotic plants that are in the Delta. We have the Sacramento Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant that's now discharging about 10 to 12 tons per day of ammonium into the Delta, we believe is having a significant impact on the base of the food web. Fortunately, they are in the process of upgrading their plant. So by, I think, 2022, they will have gone to a, an upgraded plant and hopefully significantly reduce their ammonium loading. We also have a goofy system. Uh, the state water project as originally authorized included a peripheral canal. Um, it was never constructed, as you well know. So as a result, we continue to operate out of the South Delta where, because it's a dead end, as fish come down into Clifton Court Floor Bay, they're, they're picked, they're screened out through those springs, they go into those white buildings, a white bucket, they get loaded into a truck, and then they have to take a 20 mile truck ride, and some 8 million fish take this, mostly, you know, these little fish, take the truck ride uh, over to Sherman Island where they're dumped down a pipe and put back in the Delta. Guess what's waiting at the end of the pipe? <laughs> so here's, here's a new animation, just fairly new, created to, to cope at a point that we believe is extremely critical. And that is, here's what the Delta used to look like 200 years ago. Uh, this again was a very wild place with a lot of fish. Historic account salmon that were five feet long. Um, they used to be harvesting 10 million pounds of salmon a year out of the Delta, 12 canneries. Um, but this was a wild place, and the reason it was so valuable, functional, was because of the food web. And what some of the scientists are now get, beginning to calculate is the amount of uh, carbon detritus that used to be emitted out of these Delta waterways. So we're going to fly under uh, water here, go into a tidal marsh, down into the water and look at the zooplankton, phytoplankton, and maybe some of the detritus that was floating around and being exported out of the Delta. This is what was driving this vast ecosystem that we had in the Delta. It was just uh, some 400,000 acres of tidal marsh that used to exist. And this animation shows as the Delta would fill up, these areas would get inundated, and then as the tide would drop, um, that food would then be coming, become available back down out, out into the channels uh, for export and transport into areas where it could be consumed. So today, though, because of subsidence, we are limited to where we can do tidal marsh restoration in the near term because of land surface elevations. Subsidence in this part of the central part of the delta has caused these areas to be, like I said, 20, maybe 30 feet below sea level. So we're limited to doing our tidal marsh restoration in the areas that are green or amber color. And we're, what we need to do is create these broad corridors of habitat through the delta um, and out into the Susun Marsh 
for these native species. So here's what happened when, uh, if you take this picture, it was taken right up here, and this is an area that was a farm field. It flooded in 1992 and simply let go, and nature has come in and restored this area very well, all on its own, to a very vibrant uh, Tuttlemer system. And matter of fact, if you want to go catch Delta smelt, this is the area you want to go. Because it's, we have a lot of Delta smelt using these uh, areas up in Liberty, Old Holland Track area, as well as in the um, Deep Park Ship Channel. So the other, the other area we're working on is the Yol Bypass. It's part of a what's called the RPA, which is a reasonable prudent action under the biological opinion. The water projects, state and federal water projects, have a requirement to create 17,000 acres of new seasonal floodplain habitat. And this is the bypass right here. It goes up along through there. Uh, so where we're working is up at the northern end of the bypass, Fremont Weir, to put gates, into, notches gates into the weir to move some of those juvenile salmon uh, down into the bypass so that they can enjoy the floodplain. So what happens, this is a good example what happens when you put a salmon out on a floodplain? This is a uh, baby salmon, salmon fry. If you leave them in the river and they go out through down through the delta, research has shown that they about they stay about the same size. They don't grow much. But if you put them on a floodplain after six weeks or ten weeks, you can see how much larger and fatter they grow. We call these floodplain fatties. And what are they feeding on? One of the things they're feeding on is daphne. So you put water out in the floodplain, you get large blooms of daphne dragging nut through the water, and you, the nuts are just clogged with these zooplankton. So what's a vision for the future? Where do we go? The UC Davis and Public Policy Institute, PPSC, have created in one of their prior reports, what does a sustainable delta look like? They have shown parts of the delta are probably going to end up flooded with the water. We'll have wildlife friendly agriculture. We'll have these corridors of habitat that come down through the delta. I think we need to start planning for what the delta is going to look like, kind of my early theme here, instead of what it is today. What is a sustainable delta in the face of these forces, and how do we get there? Yes. The tension between uh, the AQMD and this, I mean, you're, you're giving off what probably is one of the largest amounts of uh, greenhouse gases being produced anywhere. Uh, and are the state through the AQMD under tension to change this thing? Uh, not yet. Uh, hopefully that there's some, some future actions to recognize that the Delta is discharging uh, large amounts of carbon in the gas. Yeah, that's probably about 15, 20 percent. Well, in the, if you look at the Delta's contribution statewide, we did some back of the envelope calculations. The uh, Delta is contributing about the same amount every day. Uh, well, I found this statistic interesting. If you calculate the loss of soil every day, it's about 2,300 dump truck loads of peat soil leaving the Delta every single day. That's a lot of dirt. And the carbon emissions are about equivalent to the entire fleet of Southwest jets, what they are emitting in terms of their CO2 footprint, as what the Delta farmland is emitting. And it's about, in round numbers, about 1% of the state's total carbon discharge. But much higher in methane. Yeah. yeah. So where is the future? I believe, um, I think many others do too, that we need to separate the water supply from the ecosystem. The conflicts we have today are not good for either. Uh, our water projects in the Delta are not good for the ecosystem, and the ecosystem would be much better off if we can move our water supply up into the North Delta. So it's a win-win situation. As a matter of fact, when I have private conversations with some environmental groups, they will tell me that they support the tunnels. The problem is they want to operate them. They said, we, we think the tunnels are a great idea, but you got to let us operate. 
So one of the things that we do by separating the water supply from the ecosystem is we let the fish maintain their natural migration. Uh, they don't have to take a 20 mile truck ride and be put down a pipe. We keep the nutrients in the system. And we, when we separate the water supply, we get away from the earthquake risks. We get away from the sea level rise risks. We get away from the dissolved organic carbon loading, the trihalomethane loading. And we get away from a lot of these environmental restrictions or regulatory restrictions for delta smelt because we're getting much further away from the delta smelt populations. So uh, the tunnel alignment, if you haven't seen it, looks something like that. Um, I thought this was an interesting slide I threw in just to show you uh, when you look at major water projects as a percent of assessed value in the past, the Colorado River Aqueduct, the state water project, BDCP, which is now the California Water Fix, you look at the percent of um, assessed value, it's a very, very small percent of assessed value, the, the cost of the, the tunnel project. So what we're currently doing is what I call the Band-Aid project. We're actually just trying to hold this, patch this system together because it's not sustainable in its current form. So hopefully you've learned a little bit about subsidence and sea level rise and salinity intrusion. And now I'm gonna show you, hopefully, if you're okay with this, one of the things we're doing to learn more about salmon is we're actually implanting, this came up in the discussion last night, um, these salmon are surgically implanted with little tiny receivers. Actually, these receivers are about five years old. Um, if you're squeamish, turn away. <laughs> so they, they put a little, uh, the, these receivers are much smaller today than they were five years ago, but uh, now they're getting quite small. You see that one's pretty big. And then they... <laughs> so historically, um, this was done 5, 000, over 5,000 fish. Just this past March, uh, we did this to 1,200 fish. When I say we, the USGS, John Bureau and his team at the USGS have did a fantastic job looking at survival of salmon, uh, and route selection down the Yellow Bypass, down the Sacramento River. Uh, and it's this kind of technology. And we, we think maybe if this technology continues to improve, we will have uh, smelt tags we can implant a little tiny tags and del tiny delta smelt and trap them as well. So we'll see if that technology continues to pursue. So um, with that, I think I'll close it up because I think I'm right on. They're telling me right. So these uh, little tags are acoustic tags, and there are receivers placed throughout uh, the delta or the old bypass, Fremont Weir, and as they pass by, these receivers say, okay, I found, you know, Fred went by and Jane and then Harry. And, uh, so they know which fish went by, when they went by, and then if that fish doesn't show up at the next receiver, yeah, it, we blame the bass. But, and then we've actually, when I say we, and John Bureau tells the story about when he was down in the North Delta in his houseboat and he had all his receiver equipment there, they would actually watch. What, what's really interesting is these, these salmon migrate at night. And the minute the sun comes up, John said, you watch them hightail it to the shore, and they're banging up against the shore trying to find a place to hide. There's no place for them to hide, and all of a sudden you see one, two, three, four, five of these salmon all in a tight-knit bunch, moving upstream along the channel, and that is, that's a cell tag strike. Self tag striper, so that in the belly of the striper, so now we're actually tracking the striper in the back of the center. Using comment at all on navigation, the history of the navigation and the impact that that's had on the development of all of the levees and right. the maintenance, and, and what's the, what's how is this play into the future? Is, is it worthwhile? To Well, so your point is that when the Sacramento River levees were constructed for navigation, the levees were placed right up along the river in order to cause the river to scour. And as a result, we have no um, overbank or floodplain associated with the rivers. We've lost all of that very valuable habitat. And uh, what we're trying to do now is to recreate 
we're going to go back, to, you know, correct the mistakes from 100 years ago by trying to set levees back to create that kind of habitat that had been set them back in the original. But, you know, it was all for the paddle wheel steamships that, you know, didn't stick around very long anyway. And so we, we have this legacy of levees. They also have the deep water ship channels. They're uh, importing, you know, creating the potential to move salt further into the Delta because they're they're allowing these deeper channels to uh, have the salinity. Um, you, you showed that the Delta 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 Everybody hear the question about, um, okay, the question was, have we looked at as part of an emergency response strategy doing what they've done in Holland, which is to put big gates out. So in Holland, big flood surge, uh, surge from the sea, big gates close, they stop those flood waters from coming in. Um, there have been proposals to build massive gates and going way back into the 50s and earlier, proposals to build uh, gate systems that would basically stop the tides from coming into the delta. And we look at those, those have been defeated. I think it was a good, good, good thing that they were defeated because once you block these areas off, you're basically shutting off all the tidal action, most of the tidal action. And that would be a serious, significant blow to the ecosystem in the delta. Those, those Stay open. They, they, they stay open until necessary. They're a system of blocks. Right. Just like we have there. And we, and we actually, when we were looking at the urgent, or, excuse me, emergency pathway, uh, we looked at the potential for building a gate that we would simply close. And it turned out that was like over a billion dollars to build that gate system if you could get it approved. And we believe that the emergency pathway, a much cheaper solution that buys you time while we're trying to advance the tunnels. The tunnels are the ultimate solution. Uh, the 30, 30 by 20, 30 is pretty interesting. The, the second 30, the 30 billion dollars, regionally, industry-wise, who's gonna share that cost if something tragic happens up there? Well, that, that cost is a statewide cost, so it's Bay Area, the Delta itself, impacts, transportation, um, Southern California water supply, San Juan, so that's the aggregate of all those impacts. Well, what so, percentage for Southern California? I, don't have I, don't, I, I, would suggest, I would suggest probably that there is a, of the 30 billion, I'm guessing it's more than half of that impact. Is, but but it, there is, the, the benefit for Southern California, and the, by the way, those numbers are based on uh, no pathway. So the pathway, which will be implemented will greatly reduce yeah. metropolitan Southern California's impact because we will be with instead of having two years of outage or three years of outage, we believe we can use Diamond Valley and other in you know in basin storage to get us through the six months while we're building the pathway and then we'll have that fresh water source again. Uh, Kurt, one of the biggest challenges in the Delta are all the farms and the farmer that's done there. What's the total value of those farms and what would the cost differential be if we were just to buy all the farms at maybe five times value? Um, <laughs> what, would that be cheaper than the tunnels? Well, I will, yeah, I will, I will refer you to a report done, which I found extremely valuable, a report done by the UC Davis folks under the Watershed Science Center. Um, Jay, Dr. Jay Lund and some of his group there put together a paper that looked at the economics of the Delta Islands and found that 34 islands in the Delta are economically unsustainable. That is the cost, obviously the cost of these high maintenance, levy maintenance costs don't come close, or the, the value of the island, the assets, the farming, don't come close to the cost of the levies. One of the, one of the statistics
that is contested by some of the locals is during the Jones Track levee failure, you know, the Jones Track flooded in 2004, the state came in, the state and federal government came in through um, repairing the levee, pumping out the island, uh, rip wrapping the island, paying for all the damage claims. Some estimates about 60 to 70 million dollars. And if you, my, my recollection at the time, you probably could have bought the island for maybe 30 million. Very good question, a common question. The tunnels, uh, 40 foot diameter tunnels, the governor likes to call them pipes, so I'll call them pipes, um, are down 150 feet below the surface. So the number one, the, the shaking is going to be less as you go deeper. The tunnels are designed um, through a whole bunch, through, through a series of rings. Each one of these rings is about five feet long, attached to the next ring through a series of pins and gaskets. So there are no offsetting faults along the tunnel alignment. The faults in the delta are quite deep. So the delta will, these tunnels will sustain um, motion, but they won't sustain a transverse crack across the alignment. The design is that they will withstand the motions up to and beyond, I think, a 500 year uh, seismic event in the delta. So I think I'm, what I've heard and seen is that the design has been very thorough in terms of looking at the, um, the potential damage to the tunnel system as a result of that. Does that answer your question? Kurt, um, one of the things I got out of talking to you yesterday and last night was when we look at the Delta from Southern California and Orange County's perspective, we look at it as a source of water and a flow coming to us um, when we hear the debates on the fisheries, the answer seems to be that if we didn't divert the water and we left it in the system and there's more water for the fish, they would fully recover and everything would be hunky-dory again. And so the basic, we hear a lot of biologists and fisheries folks say, stop taking the water and it will restore. And then talking to you, I heard a different message, which was the fish are starving to death there because of the destruction of the ecosystem and what they really need more than flow is food. Right. Can you shed some light for this audience on the food issue versus the flow issue and where you think that's going? Right. Well, I, mean, I referred to John Bureau several times. Um, one of the quotes I like to say from John Bureau is, you can't go fish in a pipe. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to put a whole bunch of water down the pipe and we're thinking that we're gonna get more fish and we need more habitat. Um, we need that land water interface. We need all that carbon into the system. So you can put, and I think the, the years, the last decade has borne out in that we've continued to put more water down the system and we haven't seen the Delta smell recover. So we need, you know, I think Einstein's quote is, you know, something if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, it doesn't work. You keep getting the same answer. I think we ought to try. So one of the things we talked about yesterday is I think we need a paradigm shift. We, we got to recognize that the Delta continuing to do the same thing we're doing now is not working. We need a major paradigm shift and that is to have, as was proposed under the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, a massive <coughs> habitat restoration program. 30,000 acres, 100,000 acres, large corridors of habitat. And I believe, as many others do, that that's gonna make a significant difference. And if we can delist these fish species, that's what's going to free up water supply. That's the paradigm we need to be thinking about is um, delisting these species. Um, and I think doing that in large part through habitat restoration. Simply say that land is lost and it's going to go back to nature. 
Yeah, I don't know if everybody heard the question. Um, we're going to have, certainly we're going to continue to have levee breaks and flooded islands. And the question is, do we, when we get those levee failures, do we reclaim them or do we leave them flooded? And one of the things that the 2009 legislation did was to require from the um, Delta Stewardship Council that they prepare a island prioritization with the idea that I think the, the goal was, certainly from our perspective, is that you know you want to put these public dollars, large hundreds of millions of billions of dollars of public money, ought to be going into where you're maximizing public benefits. That's certainly not the case today. So, um, you know, there's a move to try to get there, and how do you do that in terms of maximizing public benefits? What an outstanding discussion of the Delta.